Hello, thank you, welcome. I know it's the end of the day, but this is the last session here. This is on Heat Networks. Uh, we'll be running through a series of very interesting, but hopefully brief presentations to keep you all interested. Uh, my name is Simon Woodward, I'm the chairman of the UK DA, and uh, I'll just quickly run you through who we are as an association, some introduction and some member benefits. So we were formed in 2010 with six founder members. Uh, and we brace all companies from across the sector, be them consultants, advisors, suppliers, um, and organizations who create and own schemes. We have 160 members in the association, and those come from all walks of life. Uh, they come from a combination of equipment suppliers, consultants, legal advisors, local authorities, and energy services companies. We offer members the monthly journal, 50 to 60 page journal, explaining what's going on in the world of district energy. We've also got a website, which is the marketplace for everything going on in the world of heat networks. It includes details of training courses uh, and also um, our webinars and a library with 500 documents. We have member meetings regularly if you want to find out more about what's going on in the sector. And you can also, through us, contact the Department of Energy and Security and Next Zero. Number five, we have a series of working groups looking at key things happening across the sector and we respond to consultation responses. We've just responded to the Future Home Standard consultation response. Number six, we're running a series of webinars. We usually have three or four across the year, and now those are CPD certified. Number seven, in-person events, things like Future Build we have here, um, and also we're gonna be having a Heat Networks Expo in the autumn, which will be very exciting. We plan 50 exhibitors and uh, four to 500 delegates. Number eight is the training register that 25 members participate on with 100 courses. Number nine is the job school where you can advertise for free. Number 10 is our podcast. Number 11 is the awards. And finally, there it is, to join, it's very cheap a year, 810 pounds a year. So I'm not here to promote the UKDA per se. I'm here to give a window for four of our members to talk. We've got four very interesting presentations. So without further ado, ado I'll ask Mark Wettel to come up and talk about uh, Heat Networks uh, from CPV, over to Mark. Thank you, Simon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Wettall, Managing Director of CPV Limited. I'd just like to share with you today how through innovation within heat networks, we might ease that path to decarbonisation. A quick introduction to CPV. Uh, we're a UK company and we're a specialist polymer and manufacturing company. And we focus on a number of core sectors or areas of application. And these include, of course, heat networks, our focus for today. Uh, and in fact, CPV has been supplying product now for over 40 years, pre-insulated piping products to the industry. Uh, we're involved in critical infrastructure applications where we develop piping solutions for demanding critical sectors, power generation, technological manufacturing, and increasingly uh, hyperscale data centers. And quite typically, this is uh, prefabricated and then some synergy with heat networks as these are pre-insulated and then increasingly move towards uh, waste heat recovery is an area of focus for us. And then we have our roots in chemical process and drainage applications for pharmaceutical, food and beverage, power generation, and so on. So that push for net zero carbon is urgent. Um, we all understand that heat networks will play a pivotal role, but we need to do much more to accelerate this uh, with both more cost-effective solutions as well as more sustainable solutions. So I wanted to share today with you how through innovation in piping technologies, we one might reduce that cost of installing heat networks, how we might reduce the cost of operating heat networks, and importantly, how we can ease the path to decarbonization, reducing carbon footprints. So our philosophy at CPV has, has always revolved around innovation, um, and that means we've had to challenge convention. So not just to understand its weaknesses, but also its strengths. And carbon steel um, has, of course, been the dominant conventional piping solution for heat networks, and that's arguably for good reason, but there are some inherent weaknesses. Uh, and in previous discussions here and elsewhere, we've sort of explored how these might be overcome with uh, alternative materials. Um, we looked at obvious parameters, being corrosion, flow characteristics, thermal stress, installation, and so on. And so whilst these focused and then demonstrate opportunities to reduce costs, they of course do support the drive towards net zero carbon. However, we have some, some transition um, to uh, second and then third generation. Sorry, jump, jump one ahead then, apologies. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. So as we move now from second to third generation and then fourth and beyond, the significance here is that there's reducing network temperatures and these indeed open up opportunities for further adoption of alternative polymer piping solutions. So CPV's latest innovation uh, for pre-insulated piping is Highline Clover. And this is a product that's been specifically developed to support the challenges of delivering the UK's heat networks, reducing their financial cost and importantly their environmental cost. The Highline Clover product, it's manufactured by CPV here in the UK and offers a full network solution with a complete range of products and it has the capability of an undiminished service life for 50 years. So with CPV service offering and supporting those tasks with delivering the network, the Highline Clover range is, is well placed to serve the UK's developing and indeed the future networks. So Highline Clover, it looks distinctly different. It's not black. Um, I love to tell you there's good technical argument for this, but I'll be honest with you, it just makes it look different, interesting. It's grey in colour, permanent orange identification stripes. And that will have a, make it easily identifiable as a heating utility pipe and as opposed to being a nondescript other service pipe. It comprises of a high performance polymer service pipe um, to relevant standards and from material that's been specifically developed for hot water distribution. The insulation is a rigid polyurethane foam structure and all is encased within a high strength polymer casing to best resist the rigors of a long service life below ground. Our innovative twin or duo pipe configuration is oval, or should I say actually stadium shaped. And this really offers optimal thermal insulation for minimum material content and the smallest physical dimensions. So this configuration does have the potential to reduce cost, uh, and of course the cost of transportation, and this will further demonstrate efficiencies and sustainability. So Harline Clover pipes are supplied as semi-rigid 12 or 6 metre lengths and together with fitting assemblies that f reflect traditional configurations that we would see in carbon steel. Jointing is by means of proven fusion welded technologies and these can be either butt fusion or electrofusion. And then we have our innovative um, click weld system which is effectively a, a click factory fitted system which is, is clicked together and then uses integrated electrofusion technology. And of course, through these proven fusion technologies, um, they're highly efficient and effective. Uh, they can be quicker and more cost effective than conventional welding and they can help address some of the significant shortages, skill shortages that we have in the industry. That all important thermal efficiency, so Highline Clover utilizes a water blown polyurethane foam a lambda value of 0 0.021, uh, and this is configured with a default insulation thickness which is aligned to series two insulation. So if we compare that to a typical pre-insulated steel pipe, then high and clover can demonstrate some improved thermal efficiencies and reducing those distribution uh, network losses. And of course, this plays a fundamental role in that overall energy cost and reducing the carbon footprint. So Highline Clover pipes have exceptional flow characteristics and given there is no risk of corrosion, then these flow characteristics can be maintained throughout the life of the network. They might present opportunities for pipe size reductions. It will improve and then maintain pumping efficiencies. It will reduce long-term maintenance requirements and importantly, it eliminates that risk of any premature failures through corrosion. Holland Clover pipes, they also have the advantage of being significantly lighter than steel and they can be up to a sixth of the weight of steel, so that will ease transportation, handling and installation. So our commitment to sustainability is, is further underlined in Highline's Clover production process and this significantly reduced CO2 emissions when we compare it to traditional steel pipes. It's well documented through life cycle assessments and other similar studies that nearly, um, that, that Typically, emissions of polymer pipes are, are less than half and typically nearer to a third of a carbon steel pipe when you consider raw material extraction, processing, and then the pipe production. And this situation is further improved given that Highline Clover pipes are manufactured using uh, predominantly renewable energy 
and at CPV's UK production facility. So this gives us the capability as well of manufacturing the UK, um, that we can enhance that supply chain, we can offer greater scope and flexibility whilst reducing that CO2 emissions. So Highline Clover is offered as a comprehensive range of products. We have both default fitting assemblies as well as bespoke assemblies are offered as required by sites. Uh, we include a full range of transition fittings for connection to other materials and ancillary components, as well as pre-insulated valves, the 489, uh, and then also valve assemblies are offered as prefabricated valve set chambers. We have, a, as I mentioned earlier, a default insulation of Series 2, but equally we can offer that as Series 1, 3, or 4. Uh, and we also have Highline Clover Ambient as an uninsulated product for low temperature and ambient loop systems. So we looked at a typical network and we compared the mechanical install costs of steel against Highline Clover. Then we might see as much as a 40% cost reduction. Uh, and if we, if we took that further, looking at a hybrid system, perhaps looking at Clover with one of our flexible composite or polymer pipe solutions, there might be still further savings. And then if you factor in with Clover reduction, uh, and if we, if we took that further, looking at a hybrid system, perhaps looking at Clover, with one of our flexible composite or polymer pipe solutions, there might be there are no requirements for expansion loops or Z bends, no hot works, no NDT, and possibly no chemical flushing. And then the enhanced thermal efficiency of Clover offers reductions in cost of heat and, of course, reducing that environment impact through the overall reduced carbon footprint. So, in summary, for Highland Clover we can say that it, it serves well our objective of reducing the cost of installation, reducing the cost of operation, and while simultaneously reducing both directly and indirectly the carbon footprint of the heat distribution network. It's manufactured and serviced from the UK, so that offers security of supply with optimal service proficiencies. It addresses skill shortages and enables more efficient network installation. And it then offers the potential for improved network operational efficiencies, and it maintains those efficiencies over the life of the network with risk of premature failures reduced or indeed eliminated. So whilst Highline Clover it will present savings and does support carbonisation, we do recognise that traditional and other materials still have a role to play and will for some time. Uh, and so CPV does offer an extensive portfolio of products for heat networks and pre-insulated pipe products. And these we, we offer so we can offer a best engineered solution balanced with financial viability and whilst considering that environmental implications. And increasingly we offer these as hybrid solutions. Um, particularly with Highline Clover, it's well complemented with our flexible polymer and composite polymer solutions. CPV further supports off-site fabrication capabilities, uh, training, design support, stress analysis, and also full leak detection systems and service offerings for all of the Highline pre-insulated piping products and the Highline Clover. So, just in summary, through innovation and the evolution of materials and technologies for pre-insulated pipes, there really are very real opportunities to reduce the cost of both developing operating networks and to reduce the carbon footprint to ease that UK's path to decarbonisation. So thank you all for your interest and I look forward to talking to you further. Thanks very much Mark, much appreciated. Um, we'll now move on to uh, Colloid who will be talking us through heat networks and large scale heat pumps. Thanks very much. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Paddy McGuinness. Um, I'm the MD at Colloid Engineering Systems. We have a presentation today just about coupling district heating networks to large scale heat pumps. Um, so the presentation is going to, I'm going to just take you through a brief history of the company, do a few example projects, and talk about some innovations and trends in the DH sector. But firstly, just a little bit of background on Colloid. Um, we've been around since 2002, largely a a process engineering company, um, primarily do mechanical and electrical engineering and process engineering. Um, we started off life in the water sector actually, um, but, and we've maintained that for the last 22 years, but we've diversified into district heating and renewable energy for the last 10 years. So 
So one of the first flagship projects um, I wanted to talk through was the Bonhill Energy Centre. Um, this is a job for Islington Borough Council. Um, it, was, it was on their site, but they also shared the site with uh, Transport for London. And it was an existing vent shaft for the northern line of the, of the tube. And uh, TFL were basically wasting, they wanted to cool the, the tube by wasting the hot air from the tube. So it was an ideal uh, scenario to basically put a, to capture that heat, uh, put it through a, a heat pump and distribute that heat then to about 1,500 houses, um, two leisure centres and a school. Um, I suppose in terms of the equipment within the, the energy centre itself, uh, the first thing was basically to capture that the heat coming out of the tube, and that was done with a large air to water heat exchanger. Um, that was coupled then to about a one megawatt heat pump. Um, the heat pump itself was an ammonia heat pump. Um, and then that heat was distributed around the network um, to, to all the plant, different plant rooms. I said there's about 14 plant rooms on the site, and I said that distributed the power in turn then to the 1500 houses and schools. Within the the net within the, the energy center itself also there were a couple of smaller chps each of those were about 300 kilowatt thermal um and then there was a th we also provided power from those chps to serve the energy center and um, an additional building these are a couple of the photographs of the energy center be and the network being built um, some of the things you'll see about this it was a very tight site in a very busy part of london um and as opposed to to make it work, we had to use a lot of modular build in term for the energy center. Um, and even at that, we're, it was still very, site, very tight. We had to share the site with TFL. So it was a, a process of uh, getting into the site, doing our work, getting out again, allowing TFL to do their work before we then returned. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a difficult enough project, but um, successful in the end. The other flagship project um, I wanted to mention here was Viking Energy Network in um, Newcastle. This is a job for South Tyneside Council. And this uh, project was built on, a, on a, an existing brownfield site. There were, uh, it was initially a battery manufacturer on the site. Um, and we're basically taking water from the River Tyne, um, taking some heat out of that, returning the cooled water to the River Tyne, and then sending the, sending the heat down to a district heating network. There was a number of different technologies used on this site. Um, not, uh, for some reason, not all the technologies are coming up here, so we'll have to talk through them. There was a there was 750 kilowatt heat pump um, installed in the in the energy center, with a future with a space for a future 750 kilowatt. Um, there's backup gas boilers. There was, uh, there was CHP. There's also a solar farm on this on the site. Um, and the solar farm was at one megawatt, and that was an electrical solar. We also had a, a solar thermal, which is used to preheat the water. Um, we also had battery storage um, and a private wire network serving two of the council buildings. And then, of course, uh, we had the, the network itself, which distributed heat to about 12 plant rooms. Ah, there's the photograph I was missing. Uh, so that, that, that explains a little bit. That shows you the inside of the, the energy center itself. And there's a couple of um, photographs of just the project being built. And um, the top left is the energy center under construction with the River Tyne in the background. The middle top there, you see the, the abstraction point for the water. And one of the unique things about this site was we were able to reuse the existing piers um, for the water abstraction point. It was initially designed as a pontoon, but um, as, a as a cost saving measure, we were able to work with the client to reuse the existing states and install the, the pumps on the existing piers, um, which is all around more economical and more environmentally friendly. Bottom left, you see the solar farm, um, and then there are just a couple of photographs of the network and the energy center again. So the next couple of slides is put together kind of a summary of some of the trends we're seeing in heat networks. Um, and I suppose, uh, some of the, some of the designs that are that we're that we're seeing coming in. This was the first one I mentioned: is lower temperature networks. I mean, in the past, um, when heat heat networks were introduced, we we're talking about temperatures over 100 degrees. Now, I suppose we're building projects with temperatures maybe around 60 or 70 degrees, but there's a continual drive 
um, to get these temperatures down. Um, stage phase four design, phase five design, you were talking about temperatures of maybe 35 to 50 degrees for stage four, and maybe down around ambient for stage five. We're not seeing them being built yet, but we're from speaking to um, designers and so on, that is, that is where it's headed. Um, one of the problems, I suppose, we've seen to date with the networks we've done is making the existing buildings work with lower temperatures. Even when we're operating down at temperatures of 70 degrees at the minute, it's sometimes difficult to get existing designers or existing buildings to, I suppose, to ramp down to, to work with those lower temperatures. It's going to be a further push to get designers to work with these even increasingly lower temperatures. But I think through time, I think it's, it, it will happen. Um, second thing I put on there is about renewable energy sources. Um, I mentioned the Bon Hill project was a nice, unique project. We're using waste heat from the London Underground. Um, and there will be more industrial versions of that coming forward. And indeed, hopefully more metros and more tube stations can use something similar. Another source that we're being seen talked about a lot are data centers. Again, there, I think there has to be a bigger push there to make that happen. But it's a, it's a, it's a very, a very, very good application for harnessing the waste heat from data centers and using district heating networks. The other two I'll mention there in terms of renewable energy sources are something coming down the line. One project we're, we're in early discussions about at the minute is using district heat, which is fed from a hydrogen electrolyzer, which again, the, the electrolyzer needs, needs um, to get rid of that heat. And district heating is a, is, a, is a great way of doing that. And lastly, um, the other thing being talked about is nuclear. Again, taking the heat generated in nuclear stations and harness that into DH networks. Third point I've put on there is pipe work design. Um, there's an awful lot better information now on, on different options for the DH networks themselves. Not going to go out in detail because I've got two experts beside me who I'm sure will cover that. Um, and the last bullet point I put on there is about water quality. It, this used to be largely, this wasn't thought about that much, but it's becoming more important now as uh, people are trying to extend the life of the networks that um, there's a bigger focus on getting the water quality right. Um, Traditionally, it was chemical dosing was used to achieve the water quality we, we need. On, the, on a couple of flagship project examples I gave you earlier, it's chemless dosing uh, is being used. And um, again, getting a good water quality to extend the life of the network is very important. I've included a slide here also on heat pumps. Um, largely on these um, schemes that we've worked on or looking at, um, we're moving away from uh, uh, moving away from chemical refrigerants and towards natural refrigerants, um, the main three being ammonia, hydrocarbon, and propane. Um, ammonia we see as being a very, very efficient um, refrigerant. It uh, gives great uh, performance across a range of temperatures, but largely at the, at the, at the larger sizes, um, you don't really get, we don't really look at ammonia heat pumps below 500 kilowatts. Uh, propane or hydrocarbon, um, is another good solution, gives very good um, performance, and is, operates probably at a lower, a lower capacity than the ammonia heat pumps. And thirdly, um, CO2 is another good option, and it's a, probably a much safer option than the other two. However, there's limitations with this in terms of the return temperature. It does need that low return temperature to, to make it a consideration. Um, and I suppose with all these, you do have to consider safety. CO2 is probably the safest, but the ammonia and propane can be handled, but you do have to put in safety measures to, to make it work. The ammonia heat pump we used in Bun Hill, for example, is, in the, is the very center of a busy part of London, um, and with the right safety measures, we were able to make it work there. Heat sources um, can be coupled very easily with these heat pumps. The heat pump we used in Bun Hill, for example, is, in the, is the very center of a busy part of London. Um, and with the right safety measures, we were able to make it work there. So I mentioned those in the last slide. Um, and also, I'll, I'll mention that geothermal is an up-and-coming heat source. There, I think we will see more geothermal coupled to heat pumps over the next, over the next um, 10 years or so. Um, we're based in Northern Ireland, but there's, there's, a, there's a very good geothermal sources there, and we expect that uh, to be a, a very good source of energy over the next few years. Um, lastly, I'll mention about um, the energy center options and innovations we're seeing. Um, and the great thing with DH networks are we can bring different energy sources into that DH 
network to make it work. Um, we're seeing a lot of integration of technologies. So there's, no, there's very rarely that there's, there's one a, a energy source for one network. Um, I mentioned the Viking job earlier. Um, it had a number of different um, energy sources, so solar thermal, solar electric, it had CHPs, air source, sorry, water source heat pumps, and they all combined into the one network. Um, we're looking at another job, for example, at the minute, um, where there's air source heat pumps, there's biomass boilers, there's um, water source heat pumps on the central energy center. They're distributing the, the heat around the network, and then locally, they have got uh, local plant rooms with additional backup electric boilers and backup air source heat pumps. Um, so there's probably about four or five different technologies there on the one side. Um, one of the things we do is a uh, off-site build. We've seen that in some of the examples I've given you. Um, and a lot of the technology that I'll have to mention there can be, can be largely built off-site and brought on-site uh, in standardized control rooms. And you see that's one of the some of the standardized control rooms leaving our workshop in Northern Ireland. Uh, I mentioned control systems also. They're, they're getting up more advanced in every, every network we do. Um, we concentrate on, on getting the right level of control, right level of, um, right level of monitoring to, to give you the right performance. And that, that's increased a lot over the last um, few years. And lastly, um, I mentioned thermal storage. In this part of the, in the UK, we probably don't concentrate that much on thermal storage on site, but whereas some of our European partners um, have much larger thermal stores, um, we were on a site in, in Denmark recently, and for a, about a two megawatt um, heat output, they had about 2,000 meters cubed of, of storage on site, which is very unusual for this part of the world, um, but it does offer major advantages. Again, looking at the Northern Ireland for a second, um, they're actually considering large underground thermal storage at the minute. Um, again, we have some mains that suits this, um, but storing the storing large volumes of water at, at low temperature um, during time and, and pumping into this times of low energy cost, and then reusing that um, at a later stage. Okay, that's a quick ramble through um, my notes. Um, I'll hand back. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll hand back here to Simon. Thanks very much indeed. Um, we will now move over to our third presenter, uh, which is Lars, should be, from Kingspan Log Store, who will talk to us about pre insulated pipes. Thanks very much, Lars. Yeah, this one here? Yes, the right button. That one there. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Lars Christensen from Kingspan, and I am a regional sales director for our Log Store uh, pre insulated pipe products. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the time and effort it actually takes to bring innovation to, to the market in a, in a new product. Um, yep. Can you know, hear me? You can hear me now? Good. Thank you. So, just... Uh, oh, what's the wrong there? How does that work? Which one is there? Uh, is the right one. Which one? No, that's it's all right. Slide, no, is it? Okay. No, go back, please. One more, go back one more. No, oh, next one. That's it. Okay, we'll grab that one then. Thank you. And you can hear me now? Thank you. Good. So, um, basically, uh, Lockstore uh, and our products for, for the Lockstore pre insulated pipe is, is made in six manufacturing facilities all over Europe uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. And the output we have of pre-insulated pipes into the market is uh, about 10,000 kilometers per year. Uh, and as I said, my time is going to be concentrated a little bit about talking about the, the time and effort to bring a new innovation to market uh, and, and the time it takes. And uh, what we did at the back end of uh, 2023, we brought a new flexible pipe product to the market called PRT Flextra. And uh, it's a um, diffusion type uh, pipe system with a plastic service carrier pipe. Uh, and it's a part of our flexible pipe system product portfolio. Just in, in essence, the, 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 the PRT Flexter pipe is, um, is a carrier pipe that's uh, made of uh, PE in a raised temperature quality. It has a diffusion barrier of uh, aluminum foil, a protective layer 
and then we use our rigid PUR foam for insulation purposes. Uh, the outer casing is uh, is uh, rigid rigid um, HDP, uh, and uh, brings you basically a very very flexible pipe, uh, easy installation, etc. Originally for the PERT, we saw the, the innovation and the idea for it back in 2020, where we got involved in a, in a development, EU development project, which was a combination of Danish and Swedish companies run by Kovi. And at that stage, we were basically asked to bring a new pipe product to the market that wasn't a standard steel pipe, etc. Uh, and from there, we developed the PERT Flexter pipe. Um, what we did at that time was also not just uh, produce the pipes, we also installed them. Uh, and at that stage, we had, uh, we had two projects where we put the pipes in. Each project was about 2,000 uh, meters of pipe, uh, both twin and single pipes. And what we did, we put an alarm system in so we could basically monitor what was happening uh, at the site. Those two systems have now been, uh, been functioning now for three years and uh, we monitor it on a daily basis to see that there's no ingress of water from inside and outside to make sure that the, the pipe system stays in the quality it needs to uh, have the right insulation values and the right cost for the, uh, for the total system. So, in essence, this took some time and effort uh, to work with a lot of, of different companies uh, to bring this forward. And uh, at the same time, we also... Wanted to prove uh, with external uh, uh, Danish uh, corporation partners that Technological Institute, where basically tests were done on how the, the, the new product would perform. And the reason for bringing the PRT to the market was that we saw on standard PEX pipe you had diffusion of water into the insulation, and over time that was uh, could become an issue under basically the right um, right. Um, uh, operating conditions and for this one here what we saw if we took a standard PEX pipe that we had 367 milligram of, of water progressing into the insulation per meter per day that may not sound like a lot but if you take it over a lifespan of 30 years that's actually four liters of water coming into the insulation per meter and water in ins pure insulation that's not a good factor uh, it's uh, really bringing insulation values down and uh, it's something that you don't need. So at the same time we tested the PRT and uh, that was about 2 milligram per, per meter per day. So completely different, completely different story. So uh, with this external test we had the proof that the system we already installed were operating. We knew that this was going to work. I think something happened here because that's not my, that's not my presentation. Sorry, I don't know. I loaded the one that was on the set. Yeah, well, that's that's not mine. Uh, so, sorry, anyways, that's all right. That's uh, that was just basically a small brief on, on on effort and time put into innovation. I think half my presentation's gone, but that's okay. Sorry. Uh, I think that's probably the best thing is now to bring the next gentleman up here and uh, take it from there. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you. No worries. Brilliant. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, please uh, speak to Lars after the event to find out more about his system. We'll now pass you over to our final speaker from YG Energy. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. Hi, so uh, my name is Paul Hart. I'm uh, sales director at uh, YG Energy. Um, having formed uh, six years ago, YG HP, has grown and taking its place uh, as a leading supplier of heat interface units and heat pumps. YG Energy is the next step on that journey. So building on our heat network experience, YG Energy was created to complement YGHP by providing metering and billing services, as well as maintenance packages via our sister company, YG Maintenance. With our comprehensive range of high-performing, competitively priced products and services, we aim to be at the forefront of innovation and contribute to the delivery and operation of high-performing, low-carbon heat networks. 
We actively engage with consultants, housing associations, local authorities, and private developers. Our aim is not just to sell products, but to contribute towards the successful design, delivery, and efficient operation of heat networks. If you'd like to visit our stand, it's over there. If you want some more information, that's the end of my thinly veiled sales pitch. So, the foundation of our business was heat interface units. While we've got a really wide product range, we've specialized in the supply of competitively priced, high-performing mechanical HRUs. Our HRUs are already heat pump ready, uh, more than capable of operating with 60 degree flow temperatures. Um, Noting the comments earlier about heat networks going to lower and lower temperatures. We've got a class leading v warp result of 29 in our BESA testing, and we've got a 45 second response time from standby. While we continue to develop this technology, um, and we're always looking, to, looking for ways to uh, deliver improvements, um, at this point, this is really well established and, and um, re realistically, gains are gonna be marginal at this point. It's gonna be evolution um, at this stage. Um, while there's still a place for that, and the simplicity of a mechanical HRU um, leads to really high volumes of um, sales, and we see them going to a lot of projects, um, we see far more opportunity for innovation with um, electronic units at this point. We're in the process right now of securing the rele relevant accreditations and approvals for our new electronic HRU, which is uh, in the picture there. And we're bringing this to market in Q2 of this year. Our first focus has been to achieve stable operation at 55 degree flow temperatures, um, which we see as somewhat of a hard limit. Um, since we need to be achieving 50 degrees on the secondary anyway in order to, hit, to, to meet uh, requirements in terms of hot water temperatures um, at the faucet, um, which we see as somewhat of a hard limit um, since we need to be achieving 50 degrees on the secondary anyway in order to, hit, to, to meet uh, requirements. Further advantages of um, electronic HR use is the ability to control the valves in a more sophisticated way rather than just being open or closed we can actually control the profile of how they open and close to balance um, responsiveness and efficiency when we're delivering um, heating and hot water. Um, we put a lot of time and money into the development of um, our electronic control board to tune the efficiency of the HRU beyond anything we could realistically achieve with a mechanical unit. Um, and this product's already shaping up to be a, a, a class leader. Um, another benefit we've able to, to introduce is actually to improve the layout. So it's not only about innovation in terms of the product capabilities, but actually when it comes to things like servicing and maintenance, um, for example, in this, you can literally two, uh, two Allen bolts and uh, the plate heat exchange will be popped out and replaced. So in terms of servicing, once it is in operation, your service visits are shorter and there's a lot, a lot, a lot less cost involved in keeping them running. So with, like I said, with, with electronic HRUs, we see more pathways for further innovation and development. And that is certainly where our focus as a business lies at the moment. Um, having an electronic um, component opens the door to two-way communications, higher levels of monitoring and control, um, and that's, we can go far beyond anything that's commercially viable or realistic um, with a mechanical unit. Um, while there are already electronic HRUs on the market, as an industry, we've only started scratching the, the, the surface in terms of um, the possibilities that it opens up um, in terms of data capture, remote access, remote control and configuration. We're expecting this to be a major area of development across all manufacturers in the coming years with new features and tools being made available to, uh, to network operators, maintenance contractors and end users. As well as the hardware innovations, we expect to see more innovative service propositions being made available to network operators as well. With HRUs gaining improved remote communication capabilities, more opportunities to capture data, transfer data to a data center without the need for any sort of third party hardware. Part of the innovations we expect to see is the move towards truly open protocol billing systems um, in the future as well. Uh, 
Finally, we're also expecting to see changes to the depth and breadth of services operating by billing partners and, and maintenance companies, which the, these platforms open the door to. So metering and billing, so this is our, this is our kind of new space, if you like. Um, we're expecting that billing services in particular and billing providers are going to start to differentiate themselves with more innovative um, value-added services. So more flexible billing options being made available, um, doing more in terms of regulatory reporting, doing more in terms of carbon reporting, what carbon have you saved through your, through your maintenance efficiencies. Um, and also in more, more value-added services to residents as well, so energy efficiency support, advice, how to use your systems to, to achieve the best results. So maintenance, again, is an area we're expecting to see lots of changes as well. Um, with the technology available, we're expecting to see a lot more maintenance tasks being undertaken remotely rather than on-site visits. Um, much more in the way of targeted preventative maintenance. Um, and also proactive remedial work. So rather than waiting for a phone call from a, from a tenant, an end user, um, with a problem or a network operator saying there's an issue with their system, we're expecting to use data to identify potential efficiency issues or problems, go onto site, fix it before an end user ever knows there was anything wrong in the first place. Um, We've already got performance maintenance tools available to us and we're already deploying them as a business um, for our maintenance guys to be able to do that and we're expecting others to probably follow our lead going forward. Um, often what we've tended to find up to this point is some of the tools that are available are put into the wrong hands. So we've got performance monitoring tools that are going to some user in a housing association that probably doesn't either log into them or even know what to do with them if they did. Whereas we're trying to make those tools available to the people that need them, like the maintenance contractors, um, so that they can actually use that data to do something useful. So finally, um, we talked about innovation on products, innovation on services. Um, we're also getting a lot of uh, innovative regula regulatory changes as well. Um, we've got a lot, lot more oversight in the uh, heat network space um, and we've got more regulation on the way. Um, well, I think most people agree this is a really good thing and um, it's going to give uh, consumers and network operators greater protections. We also need to be careful that it doesn't stifle innovation and creativity. Um, in the UK, we've tended to have a bad habit when someone publishes a minimum standard or best practice. That sets the sights of our ambitions. Best practice should, should be our baseline. We should make sure we're always looking beyond that and seeing what we can do to, to, to go further. Um, those of us providing products and services into the heat network space need to keep really pushing and driving on. Um, CPD1, uh, CP1 should be, uh, and billing regulations should be seen as the bare minimum we should be doing. And I think that's it for me. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have any time for questions today, unless there are any particular quick questions from anybody in the audience. Nope. Well, I don't see anybody raising their hands, but the speakers are here, so if you would like to chat to them, please come up and say hello. So thanks very much indeed for coming on today. That's it from us on District Heating. Thank you very much. <laughs>